All right, let's talk about uh, graphical representations of summary statistics. So let's say we're considering this graph. This graph is of average height in America. I surveyed a thousand people, and this was the histogram that I came up with for everybody's height. Now, you'll notice that it's symmetric, and I remember histograms, um, they total the number of people in a certain range. So in between 510 and uh, 62, there are 341 people. Um, same for in between 56 and uh, 510. Now, generally speaking, whenever we have a uh, symmetric um, histogram like this, we can hope that it's what we call normal or normal distribution. Um, if we have normal distribution, we get to use a lot of fun tools and statistics. Um, now, this is a histogram that is approximately normal. Um, we have an average right here in the middle, um, which also, because it's symmetric, our median happens to be our mean. And then we have this distance apart. So these bin sizes, um, another thing we could call those would be our deviation. So I know you've probably been waiting all year to hear the word standard deviation, and that's our first exposure to standard deviation for this sample size. Now each bin size is one deviation out from the mean. Now eventually we're going to start dealing with fractional deviations, but in this case when we're dealing with whole deviations, let's say we have a thousand people here, then we have um, about 600 uh, and 82 people here within one standard deviation, or 68.2% of people within one standard deviation of the mean, um, and then we branch out accordingly until eventually we start hitting outliers. When you're more than three standard deviations away from the mean, you're considered an outlier. So I'm just going to label outliers out here. Outliers! And anything over here would also be considered an outlier. So as long as you're taller than 4'10", or shorter than 6'10", you're not considered an outlier. Congratulations on being part of the norm. All right, but let's talk about if standard deviation was continuous. So if it was continuous, we would have this sort of histogram thing, but now we don't have bins, we just have distances from our mean, differences from our standard deviation. Um, you notice here we have zero from our standard deviation, and we're starting to call our standard deviation by this Greek letter. This is called sigma, and it's computed by taking the square root of the sum of the distances of all the x's from your average and dividing by how many uh, x's you have. Um, you won't have to perform this calculation for my class, but it's good to know where it comes from. Um, we also call our mean x bar um, and n is always just our number of values. Now, with this being continuous, we can't just count or total how many things are in each bin when we deal with fractional standard deviations. So what we do instead is we use this Z table. It's called a Z table. We're going to be using this for the rest of the year. Um, and what we do with the Z table is we use it to compute a z-score, uh, well once we compute a z-score, which is the number of standard deviations something is away, um, so we find out what percentage of a population uh, something is bigger than or smaller than. So for example, I'm just gonna, I've never seen you guys in person, but I'm gonna make up some heights for you. So I have decided that Omar is, I don't know, 4'11". Just because that's the height that popped into my head. Okay, so let's go ahead and convert this to inches just to make our lives a little bit easier. Um, so 4 times 12 is 48 plus 11 is 59 inches. Sweet, so that's Omar's height. Now, we just saw based on our last graph that average is 5 foot 10 inches. 
x bar is 5 foot 10 inches. So we're going to convert that. So 5 times 12 is 60 plus 10 is 70 inches. All right, so 70 inches is average height. Now, if we want to find our z score, which it'll come, it'll become apparent why we want a z score here in a second, um, we can then take our x value minus our average divided by our standard deviation. Now that was supposed to be a sigma, not a six, but it's hard to tell. Now we set our standard deviation. Well, how far is it from 510 to uh, 62? That's four inches, which is the standard deviation in America. All right, so our sigma is going to be four inches. So we're gonna divide by four, and we're going to have our value of 59 minus 70 equals, well, what is that? That's negative 11 over four. Um, but if you look at my z-score table, that's in decimals. So I'm gonna go ahead and convert that to decimals really quick. Uh, negative 11 divided by four. Uh, negative 2.75. And so let's say I asked you the question, okay, what percentage of the population is Omar, who is incredibly short, still taller than? So then I would go onto my Z table and you notice there's a positive Z table and a negative Z table. I'm gonna go on the positive side and I find uh, negative 2.7 here. And if I scroll over, I'm gonna use one of my son's drawings to kind of mark that off to 0.05, so I have negative 2.75, which was the z-score that I cared about. Now if I look at that corner in that intersection, I see 0 0.0030. So this tells me that Omar is taller than or equal to that percent of the population. Or I guess this is given this has not been converted to percent, so that fraction of the population, my bad. So about 0.3 of a percent or 0.003 of the population. So that's a fraction. Uh, let's do another example with a positive z-score. Um, let's say I was um, use Jayla. I've decided that Jayla is, I don't know, six feet one inches. Okay, now let's convert that to a um, inches. So six times 12 is 72 uh, plus one is 73 inches. Okay, now we still can find our z-score the same way. Seventy-two minus, sorry, seventy-three minus seventy, all over four, because our our mean and our sigma didn't change, just the person we were finding the z-score for. Um, so that is zero point seven five. I can do three quarters in my head. Okay, so let's go ahead and find what percentage of the population Jayla is taller than. So I need to go to the positive z-score side. And I'm gonna find 0 0.7. And I'll use my son's drawing again. 0 0.75, and it's 0 0.7734. So from this information, we can assume that Jayla is taller than or equal to 0.7734 of the population. Um, 
This is really helpful for us to convert things to z-scores um, so that we can look exactly where each data point fits into um, a norm. So we're going to be using these z-scores a lot throughout the year. Um, so we'll do lots of examples, but that's all the examples we're working today. Oops. Let's put that upside down. Let's talk about uh, another distribution, shall we? Let's talk about this distribution of classroom sizes. Um, so this is the sizes in square feet of 20 classrooms um, at Blanson High School. So what we want to do is just based on the histogram, let's just talk a little bit about what we see. Do we see that there's a clear uh, median? Well, maybe our median would fall, our, our median would fall right in this area. Um, however, um, just because our median's over here, does this mean this is where our average size is? I, it seems like we have two clusters. This seems to have a bimodal distribution. Very important that histograms give us this idea um, that we can see more than just um, an average because are most of our data points actually at the middle? No, there's clusters. Our, meet, our middle is almost a data gap. Now, the reason it's important to notice things like that on a histogram, because sometimes we are given, instead of a histogram, we're given information like this. This is the same data set, it's still got our uh, 20 uh, classrooms, but instead of giving you the histogram like I just did, I'm giving you the mean, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, quartile one, quartile three, and uh, the median. Now, in order to find outliers, um, there are two strategies we could use. We could either multiply our standard deviation by three and add it and subtract it to our mean, and then anything bigger or less than that would be an outlier. Let's go ahead and do that. So if I take 68.12 times 3, that gives me 204.34. Um, so if I add and subtract that from the mean, which is 231.4 plus 204.36, Okay, so anything bigger than 435 would be an outlier. Or smaller than 27 would be an outlier. So according to standard deviation, do we have any outliers? No, we don't. If we wanted to use interquartile range instead, then we would do 1.5 times our interquartile range, which in this case is from uh, 291. 292 minus 174 and let's see 1.5 remember just what's in here is your interquartile range your interquartile range is just your distance from quartile 1 to quartile 3 um, so 1.5 times 292 minus 174 we get 177. And let's add and subtract that from our median. All right, not from our median, from our quartile three or quartile one. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip that because if I subtracted that from 171, I'd get a negative number. And I know I don't have negative number for my minimum. And if I added this, um, these are only about 60 apart. So I know that this is gonna give me way more than the maximum. So there are no outliers in this case, lucky day. Now, if there are no outliers, we often are tempted to think, oh, this must be a really nice central uh, set of data. Let's go ahead and uh, graph this. Uh, median is at 253.5. So looks like from here to here is 30. So this is 253-ish. 
We go to 292 is somewhere in here. Um, 174 would be somewhere in here. Our minimum, was, our max uh, was 134, so that's going to be uh, somewhere here-ish. And our maximum, let's see, it's like somewhere here-ish. Okay. So if I look at this just based on a box and whisker plot, it looks like we have some nice centralized data that maybe has some leftward skewing but it's pretty central. You don't see the bimodal aspects, so it's always uh, important if you want to see the data um, as accurately as possible, you want to see it in multiple representations. Okay, let's talk about a different situation. Oops. Let's talk about gas prices. So, uh, gasoline um, prices have increased in recent years. Many drivers have expressed concern about the taxes they pay on the gasoline for their cars. In the United States, uh, gasoline taxes are imposed by both the federal government and individual states. The box plot shows the distribution of state gasoline taxes in cents, or is it state gasoline taxes, not federal yet, um, in cents per gallon in all 50 states in January of 2016. All right, so we took a sample size of 50, and we made a little box plot to represent the taxes. So based on this box plot, what is our median and our interquartile range? Okay, well, let's look at our median. It looks to be just over 20 cents. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call that 21 cents.